Okay, excellent. Um, welcome everyone to this IEF's forum, Managing and Communicating Climate Risk. Um, we're going to be hearing from three expert speakers today on the topic of climate risk, what it is, case studies on how it can be managed, and the best ways to communicate risk to key stakeholders. We will hear from all three of our speakers, um, and you will then have the opportunity to ask questions. Please do submit these in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any point during the presentations, uh, and I will then read these out on your behalf later on. If directing a question to a particular speaker, please do write this in the question. Um, Thank you so much for logging in. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, I'll now introduce our first speaker. So I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Daniel Quiggan, Senior Research Fellow with the Environment and Society Programme at Chatham House. Daniel will be talking about climate risk assessment and how to convey the most important climate risk to decision makers. Thanks very much, Daniel. Over to you. Great. Thank you very much. Just bring up my presentation. So hopefully you can all see that now. Um, so, yes, as Ethany said, uh, looking at uh, a recent uh, report that we put together, Climate Change Risk Assessment ahead of COP26, um, the objectives of which were to demonstrate to heads of state that the impacts of climate change are severe, such that there is a greater awareness of their country's need to move heaven on earth to avoid such outcomes which includes ramping up ambitions and uh, producing detailed decarbonisation policies and adaption plans and deploying significant low carbon investment and a move towards, and this would be interesting to maybe pick up in the Q&A later, a move towards an international multilateral forum holding a more detailed and annually updated register of climate risks, for instance, the UN Security General or UN, UN Security Council. Um, all of the work is based on phase one and two of the UK-China Cooperation on Climate Change Risk Assessment Project, which you can see on the right there. And the idea was to produce a holistic and succinct summary of emissions and direct risks, as well as systemic and cascading risks at global and regional le levels. And as I said, the reports were published ahead of COP26. The audience of a 12-page summary was for heads of state and relevant ministers, um, with it being critical to engage heads of state of big uh, emitting countries. And there was an additional 50 page report covering the supporting detail and uncertainty caveats for policy officials and advisors. And the reason for these two reports, one being the summary of the other, will become clear as we go through. So in terms of jumping forward and looking at the impact that the uh, report had, there was uh, massive media engagement coverage in many different outlets. There were 13 country specific uh, workshops uh, discussing the messaging of the report with indeed the US uh, workshop taking the report to Joe Biden's office. You can see there a list of the different countries uh, where those workshops took place and all the workshops included high level briefing officials to relevant ministers attending COP. Um, it was also sent out via DIPTELS ahead of COP by the UK government. And we did multiple side events and UNFCCC official side events at Glasgow covering the outputs of the report. And probably for me, one of the most sort of personally, um, I don't know, uh, um, uh, relevant impacts that it had is Chris Packham, who's a bit of a hero of mine, saying that it was probably the most important report ever with an eight minute video post COP that referenced the report. And Alec Sharma, the president for COP26, continues, continues to use the CCRA in many of his public speech, speeches. Essentially, this was only really possible due to the iterative co-design approach that we took uh, with Lucy, who's on the call, and you'll, you'll see a presentation from her as well, as well as her uh, colleague, uh, Chris Demere, and various input workshops with senior policy and briefing officials from the countries attending COP. So just a few definitions then. So risk analysis con considers the probability of a given severity of impact. In quantifying climate risk, risk is a function of the probability of a given climate hazard and how that hazard translates into impacts via society's exposure and vulnerabilities to the hazards. Impacts are consequences of a realized risks on human and natural systems. So this is a diagram that we use sometimes to kind of convey this. So just uh, focusing on climate risk, which is sort of the embodiment of the entire diagram. Uh, climate risk is a function of the probability of how given climate hazards and how that climate hazard translates into impact via exposures and vulnerabilities. And you can see there how we sort of conceptualize how hazards, exposures, vulnerabilities, 
all coalesce into the probability of a given impact. So a few more uh, definitions. A systemic risk or disruption is a sequence of cascading indirect impacts initially triggered by a climate impact from direct impacts to first or order indirect impacts or second order uh, indirect impacts and so on. The climate hazard is the initial trigger that initiates the cascade of risks resulting in systemic crises and the exposures and vulnerabilities of a population or human or environmental systems can be thought of a combination thought of in combination, sorry, as the resilience to a cascade of impacts or systemic risk. The vulnerability is the degree to which a natural society system is susceptible to and unable to cope with adverse effects of climate change. Hence the propensity of exposed elements such as human beings, their livelihoods and assets to suffer adverse effects when impacted by hazard events. And the exposure is the nature and degree to which a system is exposed to significant climate variations. Exposure refers to the inventory of elements in an area in which hazard events may occur. Hence, if a population and economic resources were not located in or exposed to potentially dangerous settings, no problem or, of disaster risk would exist. So just thinking uh, now about uh, the sources of uncertainty, uh, under the ideal approach. And I think it's important to consider these sources of uncertainty because the audience, as I've said, uh, for this report was principally heads of state and high level briefing officials and ministers attending COP. And so all of that uncertainty really needs to be collapsed down um, and simplified. But obviously there's a lot of complexity within the climate science itself. And so we're trying to deal with these sources of uncertainty um, and produce simplification without reductionism. So considering these sources of uncertainty is incredibly important. So the ideal that we were striving for is defined by uh, Simon Sharp, who is a, um, uh, a civil servant, a high level civil servant in the cabinet office and was leading the COP unit um, some time ago. And so as he defines this, the ideal is that the risk of climate change can be understood more clearly when research starts by identifying what it is that we most wish to avoid and then assesses the likelihood as a function of time by providing a clearer picture of the overall scale of the risks of climate change. Such assessments could help inform the most important decisions of all, how much effort to put in reducing emissions. And so this would require by its nature to fulfill this brief, a bottom up nation by nation definition of the climate impacts they wish to avoid and the thresholds of concern at which these impacts are reached. This in turn requires detailed and extremely detailed stakeholder engagement, engagement across all nations, or in other words, thousands of thresholds of concern for various climate risks and hundreds of nations. Working backwards from these thresholds of con concern, it would be required to identify the climatic conditions that would bring them about, assessing their probability of occurrence each year, which in itself would require damage functions relating impacts in a given year to metrics of climate change, e.g. the global mean temperature or sea level rise, the vulnerability and exposure of a population to a given climate hazard, and the socioeconomic pathway of a given nation out to a given time horizon, De describing the population in a given area that the climate hazard may develop in. As well as this, it would require assumptions as to the adaptation me measures that lessen the impact of a given climate hazard that nations may take between now and the given time horizon, and the changes to, cli to climate within each specific region, climate model and ensembles, in response to an assumed emission trajectory, in itself requiring climate models to accurately quantify Earth system dynamics and feedback mechanisms, inclusive of tipping points. And finally, the global emission trajectory, hence the mitigation policies and low carbon deployment of each nation. All of these steps contain uncertainty. However, due to reasons you'll see in a minute, we actually took a different approach and the adopted approach rather than the ideal approach. So this was essentially because the nation by nation assessment of thresholds of concern requires stakeholder engagement across nations 
on a level simply not possible and not undertaken in any of the research to date. So if you think about it, you would need to go out to stakeholders and say, OK, well, what concerns you? Maybe in Bangladesh, that would be flooding. And so engage those stakeholders and say, well, what's the level of fl flooding that would uh, derive the impact that you're most concerned about? So those thresholds of concern would need to be specific to individual nations and indeed down to individual community levels. And that work to date has not been conducted. So a simplification and a di departure from the ideal is that we took a top down assessment of thresholds. Um, and then applied them. And this draws heavily on work by Nigel Arnell um, and his colleagues at Reading University. And direct risks and their associated impacts should therefore be treated as indicators of climate impacts as generic thresholds are applied to all regions, i.e. the threshold of flooding is the same whether you're in Bangladesh or whether you're in Peru. So a top-down analysis switches the order assessment, i.e. we start with the emissions trajectory down to the impacts under that particular trajectory. And I'm not going to touch on all of these because there's quite a long list, but there are further sources of uncertainty and simplifications under this approach, all of which need to then be represented and conveyed to those heads of state. So Arnell and his team uh, present impact in indicators for all regions against all so shared socioeconomic pathways and representative concentration pathways, where the SSPs are the socioeconomic uh, uh, exposure and uh, RCPs are essentially the emissions trajectory pathways. And here we simplify and justify that simplification simply down to RCP 4.5 and SSP2, but there is significant debate over the utilization of RCP 2.8 through to RCP 8, and SSPs are uncertain, and in and in of themselves, simplifications as to how societies may develop. And the translation of climate forcing to yearly global mean temperature and spatial variabilities of climate variables are characterized by magic energy balance models and 23 climate models respectively. And these lead to probabilistic projections and hence there is a range of uncertainty within them. Uh, system tipping points within themselves are not well characterized by climate models. This leads to a, a further uncertainty. Direct risks are numerous for numerous regions. And in the body of the report, we present a range of uncertainty over time uh, of given impact under RCP 4.5 and SSP 2, highlighting those regions experiencing the largest impacts within the central estimate. In the heads of state summary, we further simplified by only presenting 2050 or 2100 as the time horizon, selecting the most severe impacts across regions and risk categories. And the heads of state are concerned obviously by the worst case scenario and RCP 4.5 that we use to characterize those direct risks uh, leads to a plausible worst case outcome under this scenario with the upper end of that estimation uh, being the, the estimated distribution of potential impacts, or in other words, the 90th percentile. But the worst case scenario is also dependent on thresholds of uh, concern, vulnerability and exposure, tipping points, etc. So the worst case is a simplification in of itself. So to summarize, the science uh, versus the compelling heads of state communication uh, leads to a very difficult tension. As you can see, there are many sources of uncertainty and various simplifications. The 50 page report conveys these simplifications and sources of uncertainty, without which we risk reductionism and misrepresenting the science. But clearly there is still remains a tension when trying to convey this uh, with clarity to heads of state and decision makers. And the two reports are our best attempt to balance this tension uh, while trying not to undermine the rigor of the science. Um, and in many of the discussions that we had, uh, this sort of got summarized as collapsing the probability space for heads of state. So just some examples then as to how this is actually represented in the heads of state uh, sort of summary. I've just picked two pages of the report here. On the left hand side, you can see what we defined as heat, productivity and health. And on the right hand side, food security and just lingering on the food security one. You can see this very simple representation of the impact of concern, simply saying agricultural drought and heat stress can lead to yield declines and crop failure and food crisis. This very simplified representation of uh, the uh, climate risks uh, was well received by heads of state and their briefing uh, officials. 
Um, and all the messaging here um, really was very much condensed. So you can see that under heat productivity and health, we essentially condensed this all down into one page where there is some detail in there in the graphs and uh, some additional regional uh, differences represented in the map um, at the bottom of that left-hand side page. But it is incredibly simplified uh, versus what you'll find within the scientific literature and indeed within the 50 page report that backs up the summary for heads of state. So some of the headlines then uh, relating to those direct climate risks, uh, many of the impacts will be locked in by 2040 and become so severe they go beyond the limits of what nations can adapt to unless decarbonisation efforts are hugely ramped up. So thinking about heat waves, um, we illustrated to heads of state that heat waves are already resulting in more than 50% of COVID-19 lost working hours per year, trying to make it relevant to the current world, the, the crisis uh, that was unfolding at the time that heads of state were dealing with, and that 3.9 billion people will be exposed to major heat waves by 2040. Again, this is all under that RCP 4.5 and SSP 2, and that by 2030, 400 million people will be unable or unlike or are likely to be unable to work outside with uh, 10 million deaths per year, uh, likely due to heat waves. And then we go on to food and agriculture. I won't read out all, all three bullet points here, but just the example at the top one, that almost 50% uh, so almost 50% more food will be needed by 2050, but yields could decline by around about 30%. And then we go on to water security and so on and so on. I suppose the important bit here to highlight is that the, likelihoods of, the likelihood of risks materialising into impacts over the next 10 years is much more a function of the vulnerabilities in developing countries. And therefore there is an urgent need for adaptation measures present, to prevent the worst direct impacts in these regions as well as preventing cascading impacts across borders. So just some of the difficulties in representing systemic, so now I'm moving on from those direct impacts, heat waves, uh, food security, and so on, uh, towards the systemic risks and thinking about some of the difficulties of, of representing those systemic or cascading risks. So the constraint really is that systemic risks are driven by a cascade of climate impacts and they're extremely difficult, nearly impossible to quantify in terms of future likelihood, frequency of occurrence and impact based on one particular initial climate hazard trigger. Hence we used an expert elicitation method and our approach was to aggregate the re reviews of climate scientists, industry and academic experts as to the future plausible risk cascades they're most concerned about in order to build a comprehensive diagrammatic and narrative description of those systemic climate risks heads of state should be most concerned about and illustrating the mechanisms most likely to amplify those risks and vulnerabilities and exposures that mediate a given climate hazard towards a systemic impact. And interestingly, we found that the vulnerabilities and exposures were very difficult to represent within these cascading diagrams, and that will become self-evident in a moment. So we contacted around 250 climate scientists and sector risk experts. Around 70 experts contributed 44 diagrams, ranging from regionally specific to global in scope. And just before I present a few of those, uh, here's some examples of uh, systemic risk uh, cascade diagrams that existed in the literature uh, prior to us putting out our report and conducting the expert elicitation exercise. You can see um, that they sort of range in nature in terms of their format, um, some quite simplistic, um, some quite complicated, but really the headline for me was that at the time prior to COP26, uh, the literature really didn't contain many kind of, I suppose, holistic and easy to understand risk cascade diagrams. Um, so just quickly how to interpret the R aggregated diagrams. We need to remember that they're targeted at heads of state of state or heads of government, so they need to be compelling and elegant whilst conveying their likely chaotic nature. In terms of complexity and colour coding, the more experts contributed to a given, given diagram incre increases or increased the complexity of that given diagram, and hence diagrams are therefore somewhat busy. However, slimming them, so slimming, let's say, 10 or 20 uh, diagrams into one diagram, 
run the risk of underrepresenting the variety of submissions by different experts. And we sort of handled this by color coding them and with darker colors indicate, indicating a greater number of mentions by those experts. In terms of Daniel, five minutes left. Perfect. In terms of vulnerabilities and exposures, some experts misrepresented exposures and vulnerabilities, sort of got them mixed up and confused and didn't necessarily label a given vulnerability or exposure to a given link within that cascade or systemic uh, uh, risk uh, linkage. Um, and so the exposures at the global level becomes also a little bit meaningless, saying people and infrastructure, rather than being able to be more specific at the regional level. So our simplification at the end, when we aggregated these all, were to remove those exposures and vulnerabilities entirely. This whole exercise resulted in six, six cats, ugh, sorry, tongue twister, six systemic risk categories and associated diagrams. I won't read them out here. You can see them for yourselves. This diagram here represents, um, and it will become uh, exposed as I, I move through it. It represents um, all of the all of those six cascading risk diagrams all boiled down into one. And this was really uh, helped by both Lucy and Chris. So on the left here, you can see those direct uh, climate hazards that may trigger a given cascade. And in red, you can see some of those, uh, the, the quantification with associated time horizons as to how those direct impacts uh, might affect people or cropland and so on. And so those initial hazards, climate hazards, translate into those initial uh, impacts of concern. Pests and diseases and their movement thereof and emergence thereof really were one of the main elements that many of the experts highlighted time and time again. But you can see there's a whole range of different impacts of concern from those pests and diseases all the way through to shifts and loss of ecosystems, loss of livelihoods and so on and so on. And that these combined would lead to uh, social unrest, health crises, unemployment, poverty, deaths, food crisis, GDP loss and business interruption. And I have to say from here on in, things start to get a little bit dire and depressing. So um, I apologize for that. And the consequence of these uh, uh, direct and systemic uh, cascades would be the rise of pop populism, migration, state failure, armed conflict, market destabilization, reduced reduce global trade and protectionism. I'm just going to show you one of those specific six uh, cascade diagrams here. We're looking at national and international security. So the climate hazards that uh, experts identified most often were heat waves and least often, but were mentioned were uh, things like uh, increased marine area sea temperatures, storm cyclones and hurricanes. And that those hazards would lead on to direct impacts such as crop yield reductions and failures, drought, loss of ecosystems, infrastructure failure and loss and loss of forests. And initially within the, the, the systemic cascading uh, uh, cascade, this would lead to water insecurity, collapse of agriculture, ecosystem failures and habitat loss, health crises and pandemics. And importantly, mentioned many times by the experts, the spread of infectious zoonotic diseases and pests. Combined, these would lead to loss of livelihoods and the loss of shelter and housing. Um, and the loss of food security, putting increased pressure on, on fish stocks and potentially the collapse of marine systems, feeding therefore back into an increased loss of food security. Combined, these would then lead on to the displacement and migration of people, collapse of economies and the breakdown of governance and destabil destabilization of political systems. Again, combined, these would lead on to social instability, state failure, increased competition for resources, and I'll leave you to read the rest of those for yourselves. And finally, armed conflict in many different guises. So this gives you a flavor of those sort of uh, six uh, cascading diagrams. And I have to say they had quite a lot of impact um, with them being shared across different social media um, quite often and still do. I just thought it'd be interesting just to show you that same diagram, the national and international security diagram, where those exposures and vulnerabilities are still included. So this is a sort of version one of the diagram. So those exposures and vulnerabilities were captured by the experts, but you can see there are so many that when we then tried to boil this down for heads of state, we took the, the, took the decision 
that actually including them would just lead to so much confusion and indeed some of the experts weren't able to attribute a particular exposure or vulnerability to a particular element of the cascade that those two factors combined we ended up removing those exposures and vulnerabilities when presenting them to heads of state and I think that's just so key to keep in your mind is how do you retain uh, the impact of the message that you're trying to convey whilst also thinking about your audience in this case in this case heads of state and heads of government and I'll just hover on some of the other diagrams and then I'll finish um, and hand over to Lucy the next speaker this is uh, food security and you can see that rise of human animal and plant diseases features again uh, through to migration and displacement of people economic and trade disruption health crises and then finally energy security and I'll leave it there um, and hand over thank you very much for your time thank you so much Daniel that was a really interesting presentation um, and really interesting to see how these different systemic risks can be um can be put into a graphical form so thank you very much for that and um all attendees if you have any questions please do put these in your in the Q&A function um and at the end of the presentations we'll come on to this um Thanks, Dan. Right. OK, so moving on, um, I'm, we're really pleased to be joined by Murray Dale, Chartered Meteorologist and Technical Director at JBA Consulting, um, and he's going to be talking today about climate risk management. Murray, over to you. I don't know if you're able to see the slides at the moment. Um, yep, that looks great on our side. Thank you. OK, great. All right. Thank you. I'm, um, I'm a uh, Technical Director at JVA Consulting. I've been uh, working in climate resilience for about 20 years and um, prior to that largely in hydrometeorology uh, and I uh, had five years at the Met Office um, uh, about 15 years ago when I left. Um, so my um, talk is about converting climate projections into meaningful decision support guidance and tools to better manage climate risk and therefore um, what I was intending to talk about is, is largely UK based in this case. So um, Daniel's given us a really nice overview of the work he's done, which is a, on a very much international basis. I've got one example of a project in India, which we, I can talk about if there's time, but my main uh, focus was to be on um, some UK examples of how we can derive um, decision support guidance and tools to manage risks. Um, this slide is really just to illustrate the, the beauty of our natural environment and given that we're you're, um, from the Institution of Environmental Sciences, I wanted to uh, focus this on the way in which we are trying to manage our environment in the UK but also abroad um, and the way in which um, this environment is particularly fragile uh, and so the, it's important that we are able to leverage the the most relevant research and output from climate science and climate modeling uh, that helps us in, um, understand how we can protect the risks to this environment, both natural and the built environment. The climate models are trying to almost do the impossible. They're trying to simulate climate in um, our atmosphere. They're trying to simulate processes within the atmosphere and connect, couple them with land and sea processes. So they're doing things that are very difficult and there have been a lot of technological advancements in recent years. So I'm going to talk about one area in particular that's, that's helped us manage um, some of the risks. So Daniel's talked about a lot of the risks that are facing the world, if you like, from a climate perspective. The UK's CCRA3, Climate Change Risk Assessment third uh, version that is available from last year, um, sets out a, a range of climate risks in different categories, um, natural environment, assets, infrastructure, etc. cetera. Um, so there has been a lot of work gone into understanding the climate risks that are facing the UK. Um, I think where, there's a, a need to, to move on from this is to understand the impact of these risks and to 
understand the degree to which they're going to affect us and also not just in the future but whether we actually understand today's risks which is another matter of um, of concern for us all so there are opportunities as well it's not always all negative and it is there are some opportunities clearly for the uk but i think um a lot of the focus is on presenting um risks uh, managing risks to the uh, faced by by climate change and um how we can try to make ourselves more resilient to these so i'm going to talk about two areas that i've been working in recently which is related to changes in rainfall in the uk so two specific risks that we are facing are increases in surface water flooding or rapid response catchment flooding which is due to heavy rain rainfall intensity and then um, something that's been in the news a fair bit recently which is increases in uh, well just managing current and future climate with regard to pollution in watercourses and the spills from drainage systems so both of these areas are particularly helped by some recent climate research which is aiming to better simulate the effects of convection in the atmosphere convection if you remember from the geography days is a type of rainfall that's driven by heating on the ground and produces localized, um, typically these high cumulonimbus clouds that drop very heavy rain, um, often in the months of sort of May to September in the UK, but not exclusively. And we've seen more in recent decades that we're getting embedded convection within larger scale systems, frontal rainfall systems. So. If we take an example here from a radar imagery of the southwest of England and Wales, you can see, I'm not sure if my mouse is showing up, but you can see there just to the north of Somerset, there's a, an area of very intense localised rainfall, which is quite often these bits where the, the cells are white in higher than 32 millimetres per hour intensity, that the, the impacts of convection are felt within, within larger scale systems. So while the rest of the country might, might just be experiencing a wet day, um, certain parts could be experiencing more than just a wet day and some major flooding issues. Um, this uh, was an example in Canvey Island in Essex on, on the Thames estuary where in August 2014, typically a warm time for the UK, but when we do get um, intense rainfall events they can often be in the summertime. And here, um, the white cells showing more than 200 millimetres per hour rainfall rate. And so um, uh, some serious flooding occurred during that event. This is um, an image of, not of Canvey Island, but in um, east of London showing um, flooding of the uh, underground and just puts into perspective what it's like on the ground when, when these effects are felt. They, they can be very damaging, quite dangerous often to um, people exposed to them, as well as the damage they cause economically and, and, uh, and disruption. Now, the climate modelling that helps us understand these types of rainfall systems has taken a step forward with something called UKCP Local, which is one of the outputs from the wider UKCP18 data set that are um, helping inform those UK climate change risk assessment table that I showed earlier. Um, the, the important thing about UKCP local, as it's called, is it has a spatial resolution of just over two kilometres, which means that the, the model can represent convection, those, those individual convective cells within it relatively well. And importantly, give us the kind of totals of rainfall that we might expect um, in, in both current climate and future. So we've got a much better understanding of what might happen when you force the climate with more uh, carbon dioxide uh, in the future. And, and you can see what, um, what the impacts might be. And this has not really been possible in the past in the same way. So the UK is at a, at a cutting edge with this because we have the only national scale um, convection permitting model like this. Other countries are, are catching up, but um, this is available for us 
and it helps us understand how flood risk might change, but also how pollution risk might change. So um, the most recent version of this model, CP Locals, got 12 members of um, when the model was run 12 different times. So that means we can get a quantification of the uncertainty in the models. Daniel talked a lot about uncertainty. So uncertainty management is a key element with, with any of this. Um, and this helps us produce output like this, where we can actually map the percentage changes in heavy rainfall. So when flood risk managers put rainfall data into flood models, they use what's called a design storm. This is a theoretical, symmetrically shaped um, profile of rain that we assume occurs with a we use this term return period, a 30 year return period or a 3.3% chance of occurring anywhere in any one year. And this tool, this design storm can now be uplifted, so increased in its total depth by uh, percentage factors, which are shown here, which based on this most recent research that used UKCP local, we can now identify which parts of the country are likely to be influenced most and what is an appropriate percentage to increase your, your estimates of uh, rainfall by. And the way in which this has been, so that, that output I showed earlier was through a project called Future Drainage, which I worked on with Newcastle University and the Met Office. And then that output has now just in fact, 10 days ago, been uploaded into the Environment Agency's website for flood risk assessments, climate change allowances. So whereas previously just a single value was applicable across the country, there are now um, rainfall event increases that are available for specific parts of the country for different um, epochs in the future and for different event rarities. So this is an example of how the climate projections can be pulled through into guidance for um, managing climate risk. Another example I mentioned was related to pollution and this um, hot topic of pollution into water courses, but it's affecting both um, rivers, um, water courses that receive water, but also the um, the coast as well and um, the times at which people can bathe in in um, coastal locations so uh, a particularly environmental concern this one and with the advent of the convection permitting model that I've referred to UK CP local we've been able to derive a tool that allows you to change a rainfall time series so this isn't just a discrete design event, but it's the whole rainfall time series for say 20 years of five minute data can now be perturbed to adjusted to represent a future climate. And in this example, we can show the um, 2050 version of, of a um, historic rainfall data set. So the tool allows you to throw in some historic rainfall, press a button and output a file that gives you a perturbation of synthetic rainfall for a future date that it to some degree mirrors the climate that we should be expecting in the future. And the way in which it does that is to increase some storm events, but also reduce some rain in the summer in particular, when we are likely to be experiencing less rainfall in the future. So it makes a series of adjustments and allows you to have a new time series of rainfall that can be used to simulate rain that will then affect um, how much water is spilt into urban drainage systems and and of course then how we might be able to manage that change. Um, with this example of risk management, so building on what Daniel was talking about, there are different ways of considering risk and as Daniel pointed out there's um, different probabilities and different um, consequence magnitudes. But with that approach, you can see that in the across the middle there, with that diagonal line, you could consider a similar level of risk because risk is, is lowest in the bottom left and highest in the top right. Um, 
but different um, places in that space um, will need to be managed differently. So for example, in the bottom right, we see events which are generally of pretty low probability. We might not expect them to happen very much at all, but when they do happen, they could cause massive impact. So here's an example of the picture from the recent um, flood event that occurred with the um, issues related to the dam in um, Yorkshire earlier this year. I believe it was Yorkshire, I might be getting that wrong. Um, apologies if I have, but there's a, a significant risk related to extreme rainfall events affecting reservoirs in our country and, and abroad. And then more day-to-day -day risks, which also need managing and might be occurring more often, such as um, sewer flooding or pollution spills to bathing waters. This um, method of thinking about risk management was um, well described in a report which is now nearly 20 years old, produced by um, Richenda O'Connell and um, Robert Willows, and this put forward a number of very useful concepts about how to manage risk, um, climate risks, and then introduced concepts such as over-adaptation, under-adaptation and maladaptation, which are ways in which we can consider how we can address managing these risks and avoiding spending too much money, not spending enough money, if you like, or um, doing things in ways which are could be done better. So it was a very useful groundbreaking piece of work, which has been useful for me in what I've done in recent years. One way to manage the risk is to think of these options of whether you manage them in a precautionary way or an adaptive piecemeal way. So if you take the example of um, needing to build a bridge across a river, you're likely to only want to build that once and not to change it as you go through the next 50, 100 years or so. So you, you need to adopt a precautionary approach in that situation of how much might my river expand under climate change in the future because um, making other changes to it partway through uh, uh, may well not be uh, appropriate. But there are cases where small amounts of risk management over time can be a much more effective and cost-effective way of, of managing that risk. So the this sort of well-known um, sawtooth diagram, as it's sometimes called, shows the way in which risk can be managed um, and reduced on say five or ten year basis perhaps in the future where you can introduce measures that reduce that risk but also account for some of the uncertainty in the projections because we don't know the degree to which um, risk will change it could be you know 20 to 40 percent there might be quite big ranges of change that are potentially coming coming to meet us so the way in which we can do that in, in cost-effective ways can learn a lot from this type of approach. And here's what it might look like on the ground. So with regard to managing um, surface water, if we can come up with ways of reducing the flow into sewer systems by having more permeable um, pavements, for example, or um, ways in which uh, water flow can be reduced, uh, those can help reduce the amount of water going below ground and therefore reduce the need for upsizing sewers, which is a more precautionary approach, which you only want to do once in a few decades, really, when you're considering putting in a huge big um, new sewers. So there's examples like this in all forms of climate change adaptation and risk management. But if we can think about them as adaptive and precautionary and do what we can to try to encourage adaptive approaches where possible, they, as well as having economic benefits, they can have significant financial and um, societal benefits as well. So I've mentioned those uh, two tools which have been developed. Um, this, the first one on the right being the, the tool we developed that enables you to perturb a time series of rain and then below the output from the Environment Agency's website, which is built on the work that was done in a team I worked in to derive changes in um, rainfall for flood risk management. 
So both of these involve translation of scientific output into user-friendly information to inform large-scale investment decisions. 50 billion pounds is expected to be spent in managing sewer pollution, for example, in the UK alone. Um, but the way in which you do this does benefit a lot if you can co-design and co-develop and co-test your solutions together with between the, those who have an appreciation of the climate science and the output and those who are using the information to make these investment decisions. So the, the design of these tools has been very much involving the, the user groups right up the front. So in the design area uh, and as they've gone along and been developed and they've been consulted, users have been consulted at, at key points where they might be able to inform um, things as to how this, these um, pieces of output should be produced. So these tools are part of a, a wide group of climate services, if you like, which are now available to aid climate risk decision making. And this term climate services is becoming much more familiar now. There's a project which I'm involved in leading for the Met Office at the moment, which is developing a standard for climate services um, with the benefits that climate services need to help inform decision making. But because there could be climate services out there which are maybe not the best for making big decisions on, um, this standard which is being developed for the Met Office is trying to help make sure that climate services can be ones that users can have confidence in, trust, um, make use of um, good quality science, they're transparent so you can understand them, uh, and so on. So there are ways of developing climate services that can help those who are making decisions from them. That's a summary of my talk then and um, what I was going to say today. Um, I think converting climate projections into meaningful decision support guidance and tools, as the title of the talk was uh, based on, requires these things. Um, understanding the climate change projections, modelling and science, which is not straightforward. Um, understanding user needs and requirements as well, which is also not straightforward, but very important. And I think Daniel pointed at this point also. And this conclusion that if you can co-develop climate services, that can help support good decision making. So I'll leave it there and I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Murray, for that presentation. That was great. Um, as before, please do um, put your questions for Murray in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, really interesting to hear about some case studies and models there. Thank you, Murray. Right, finally, I'm pleased to introduce our final speaker, Dr. Lucy Hubble-Rose, Deputy, Deputy Director of UCL's Climate Action Unit and an Honorary Research Fellow in the Department of Earth Sciences at UCL. And she's gonna be talking a bit more about climate risk to climate policy. Thanks so much for joining us, Lucy, over to you. So thank you for, uh, thank you for inviting me today. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, moving from climate risk to climate policy and how you connect and engage with decision makers. I've called it adventures uh, because it sometimes feels like that. Uh, we know that, that connecting decision makers with research and converting that into action can be really tricky. So today what I'm going to do is I'm just going to introduce you to the, the CAU and what we do. Um, I'm going to give you three challenges uh, that we've identified in connecting climate risk information with policy and I'm going to dig into how that's played out in a couple of examples, one of which um, is the risk report that Dan was talking about um, and then I'm going to think about some of the takeaways from what we've learned that hopefully we think are useful to other people. So Let's get started. Now, the CAU are a little bit different from some other units that sit within universities. We like to think of ourselves as the research policy plumbers. Um, what we're doing is we are working across the domain that you can see in front of you. 
um, particularly in the, the spaces that exist between different disciplinary groups. So between officials, experts and analysts and decision makers, between academics and decision makers and at all of the different intersections where sometimes it can be difficult to get communication to work really, really effectively. Um, Today, I'm going to be specifically thinking about that research and policy connection. Um, and so that's where I'm going to focus in. So just to give you the three challenges that we've observed. So we, we've done a, a number of different projects over a number of years. And, and these are things that we have come up against again and again, that we've kind of digested down into uh, particular ways of thinking that we, we now use to approach projects. Um, and we go into thinking about research policy engagement with these things in mind. So those are challenges with language. Um, the fact that policymakers often have different risk currencies to researchers. Um, and I'll talk a bit about what that one means in a minute. Um, and then the last one is the importance of what a policy mood music is. And again, I will explain that in a second when I come to it. So first of all, thinking about challenges. Uh, with language. This is a far side cartoon. Some of you may have seen it before. Um, on the, the left hand side, you've got what we say to dogs. So we've got a chap saying, OK, Ginger, I've had it. You stay out of the garbage. Understand, Ginger, stay out of the garbage or else. And then anyone who's got a dog will, will be familiar with this. Um, what they're hearing, blah, 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 Ginger, blah, 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 Ginger. And the reason that we love this cartoon, the reason that I love this cartoon, is it captures something which we like to think doesn't happen between people, but actually happens all the time. And what that boils down to is the fact that what we think we say is often not what people hear. And particularly what we want to be saying is often not what people hear. And this is because frequently the same terminology can mean different things in different disciplinary groups. Um, so, for example, uh, a really a really great example of this is the way that uh, different groups use the term conservative risk management. So sometimes conservative risk management can mean identifying uh, the most severe risk and managing that uh, as conservatively as you can. And sometimes it's about being um, careful about identifying a level of risk because you don't want to scare people. So you're looking actually for the, 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 the thing that has less risk. But different groups of people are using that same phrase in those two different ways. Um, and that is an example of an, of an abstract term. This happens most often when the terms are abstract. And what, what that really boils down to is the fact that they have different learned meanings in those disciplines where you have something which is a piece of jargon, um, but they often also have different felt meanings. So people um, intuitively develop an understanding of what a term means, um, and, and then they adopt that. And you can't do very much to shift it. And a really great example from climate change of that is the term two degrees. So for some people, when you say two degrees, they hear that as being the boundary of doom, something that we can't cross. For other people, when you say two degrees, what they hear is Barcelona in April. The UK could be like Barcelona in April. That doesn't sound too bad. Now, if either of those things that I've just said got you th thinking, well, that's just daft. How could anyone think that? What you have there is your experience of your felt meaning in contradiction with other possible interpretation. Now we find quite often across disciplinary divides, across research and policy, terms do have these different felt meanings. And often the thing that people reach for to solve this is a definition. Let's build a definition. Let's work to that definition. But unfortunately, in practice, it's very difficult to do that and to adhere to it. So you either end up with a very complex uh, definition, which tries to admit lots of different things, or you end up with something that not everyone is really signed up to. And anyhow, they tend to revert to their felt meaning. And going back to that cartoon that I showed of, of Ginger the dog, in the CAU, we've started to call these ginger moments. So these are moments when people are using the same language in different ways. 
and you see friction happening. Now that can happen in, in, in two, two kind of extreme different ways. The first is that it causes big clashes. People reject ideas, they push back against things and often for the person that's presenting, that can be quite shocking because they don't feel they've said anything contentious. Um, the second thing that can happen is, and this more often happens in kind of collaborative teams, is you get a simmering misunderstanding that only really gets played out when you try and produce a plan or an output. Um, and so it's really helpful to be aware of when there is terminology and when there is language that people might, um, might be understanding differently and using differently. And actually, as you get used to this idea that this is a problem, you start to be able to identify those ginger moments and then you can preempt them. But it's really important to say that, that the thing that we all want to do is we all want to be able to resolve these challenges with language. But actually, in practice, they can't be resolved. They just have to be managed. And developing a consciousness of the fact that when you are speaking to a different disciplinary group, say if you're a researcher speaking to a policymaker, that this may be the case, that will really, really help in terms of being able to approach um, this, uh, the, the way that you're, you're managing that conversation. So that's the first thing that we, we've come up against. The second is this idea that policymakers have different risk currencies. So I just want to explain a little bit what this idea of risk currency means. It's the, the thing that keeps you awake at night. So it's a risk that you can understand intuitively. So for example, it's a risk to jobs a risk to the loss of life. And say, if you're a head of government, that might risk might be something like a risk of international uh, to, to international security. These are important things because if you can identify what a person's risk currency is, you can translate the work that you're doing so that it feels relevant to that risk currency, so that it resonates with it. And we find that different policy end users working in different departments, um, working in different spaces, have different risk currencies. It depends very much on what the purpose of the work is and the mandate that they have. And messages about climate risk need to be translated so that they resonate with that, that currency. Sometimes you can explain what a risk is, but it, it won't speak to what that um what that you know that person is particularly interested in it won't speak to loss of jobs it won't speak to danger to life it, it feels abstracted from that thing that is the thing they really care about but once you do um find a way to resonate with their risk currency they will often then be able to to go okay yeah i see why that's important i see why i need to take action um, and messages that aren't aligned with policymakers' risk currency, they just don't land. You give them something that you know is super important and it sits on their desk. And sometimes that's because that skim read hasn't spoken to their risk currency. So it hasn't registered that it's an important thing in relation to what they care about. And then the last one, beware the policy move music. Now, in a project that we worked on, that I'm going to talk about in a bit more detail, one of our participants said, oh, well, you know, it's all about the policy move music, the thing that policymakers already have in their head, their implicit assumptions and the mindset that is held by those policy experts. To those people, it's absolutely self-evident that that thing is true, that it's the case, but actually it can be habitual and unfounded. So it doesn't necessarily tell you that that thing is true. It's just the dominant narrative uh, for that area and for that time. And an example of this that we encountered is that we, you know, is the, the notion that we can adapt to the climate risks that we'll see in the next few decades. Doesn't mean it's true, doesn't mean it's right, but that is what is in the heads of a particular, or at least was in the heads of a particular group of policymakers that we were working with at a particular time. Now, if you're not in tune with the, the policy move music, your messages can be really, really easily rejected because according to the person you're speaking to, it just doesn't add up. So if you are, if you are saying something which gr grates against the policy move music, you have to think about how you position that and how you position it in the context of what they're already thinking. So let's 
think about how these ideas play out in practice. So I have two examples that are from the same big overarching project, the UK-China collaboration on climate change risk assessment. Uh, the first is, is about engaging decision makers with a new approach to energy transition modelling. And the second is the risk report that Dan has already so eloquently talked us through. So let's just talk a little bit about the first, um, sorry, just doing a little time check. Let's just talk a little bit about this first example. So engaging decision makers with a new approach to energy transition modeling. So I just wanna tell you a little bit about what this project was about. So we had an amazing group of researchers that it was a huge privilege to work with um, from the Institute of New Economic Thinking at Oxford. They had developed a piece of work uh, which showed that the decarbonisation of the energy system could be cheaper than has been commonly assumed and could involve, uh, you know, in, under the scenarios they were working with, it could still involve continued economic growth and potentially be achieved without large investments in unproven and expensive technologies. Um, our job was to work with them to help them land those messages with policymakers because they were saying to us, look, you know, this research should be challenging the way that policymakers are thinking about the energy transition, the way that they're, they're thinking about climate risk mitigation. And so we, we worked with them to unpick that challenge a little bit more. Let's understand what's, what's difficult about this. And so we did some work with, um, with policymakers and other energy experts in this area. And the things that we uncovered were that there is a dominant policy mood music, which is that integrating renewables into the energy system will be difficult and expensive. Now, that's that in direct contradiction to the findings of the research. And as a result of that, it meant that the research was exposed to a hypercritical lens on the technical aspects of the model. It seemed impossible that they could be showing something that was so different to the dominant policy move music. And the thing that was challenging about that is that because they, they were engaging with a mix of energy experts and policymakers and the way that the, 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 the kind of that area of policy development is constructed, conversations stopped being about the policy implications of this finding and started to focus purely on the technical. And, you know, and, and it became conversations about one model versus another, rather than, than thinking about, you know, what this could mean in terms of broadening thinking about potential futures. We also uncovered some real ginger moments. Originally, the, the framings of the model scenarios uh, were, were around rapid transition or slow transition. And we found that people had a real difficulty being able to understand it. And we're understanding that in a whole variety of different ways, because both rapid and slow are exactly the sort of terms that have those inherently felt meanings. So people were projecting their own view of what that could mean onto it, which was really inhibiting the ability to get that clear message. Now, the engagement activities that we did with them, we um, we convened uh, with the research team a set of focus groups with those energy experts and policymakers, and we went through the iterative cycle. So the challenges that I've just talked about came through a very early stage of that iterative cycle of engagement, presenting messages, listening to responses, and then modifying those messages. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about what we did in terms of listening to responses. We set them a real challenge. Um, so in terms of our role of convening those groups, we worked really closely um, with the research team to help to think about what we needed to achieve, like what we wanted to understand. And we agreed with them that it was important to understand what it was that people were actually taking away from the messages that they were sharing. And so the challenge that we set them was to, for them to present their, um, to present their research and we didn't give them any guidance on what we, the way that we felt that they should be doing it. Um, 
And we then put them into a very small group where there were three or four people and we got them to listen to what it was that people were hearing, listening to the responses. And um, we wouldn't allow them to respond. And the reason that we wouldn't allow them to respond was that we knew that if we opened a dialogue, that what would happen is that they would end up arguing about why each of those um, positions was correct. And if that happened, then we knew that that wasn't actually going to help us to develop better messages. Instead, what we did is we said, let's listen, let's take that information away and let's treat it as experimental data. So we took the information that we had about how people had responded to those messages and we worked with the research team to think about how, where they were getting things wrong, where, where those messages weren't landing, where they were being misinterpreted. And instead of thinking about a direct rebuttal, instead thinking about how do we change the way that we're saying that so people don't have that response. They don't have that, um, the response where they, you know, they're not understanding what it is that we're trying to say. Or the, the thing that we're trying to say is getting lost behind lots of other things. Um, and that, that we went through a number of iterations of that. Um, and the thing that was great is that actually we were able to develop a relationship with some of the, the energy experts and, and policymakers um, as we went through that process of modification, where they really came on board with the messaging of what we were trying to do, and they really understood it in a new way. So that was super helpful. And then the outcomes of this were that we helped the research team to adapt the report about this work. So in this instance, it was really important to actually frame it directly as a challenge and a change to the policy mood music. So there is a section in the report which is called changing the policy mood, mood, mood music. And it speaks particularly about the expectations that exist in the policy mood music around expense, energy use, and the, uh, you know, the adoption of new technology and says, you know, we don't, we don't think those things should be as part of the dominant policy move music. We think there is more, we think there is an alternative. The other thing that we did is we helped them to, to move their positioning to thinking about gaining a seat of a at the table for alternative uh, models of energy transitions. So rather than thinking about position it, positioning it as, as, a, as a kind of this model versus that model situation, instead what we wanted to do was to encourage the landscape to open up and to admit different versions of potential energy futures. Um, and that was that was a really key, a key shift. And then in the, in the more minute detail, we took some of those ginger moments and we, we tested different framings. Um, and so fast and slow transition or rapid and slow transition uh, became decisive and stalled transition. And people suddenly were able to get on board with the idea that a decisive transition was actually about a change in the way that you are um, making transition happen. And, and this approach really changed the way that researchers, that we, the researchers we were collaborating with, um, worked and thought about the messages from their research. So the way, what actually happened is they adopted this framing into their next research paper, and it kind of changed the way that they were talking about the um, about the whole the work as a whole. So um, moving on to the second example. So this is the example that Dan has talked through already. So we worked with Dan um, to help uh, him to think about, particularly for the summary. Uh, how how to uh, start to finesse this for, for heads of government. And as Dan has already said, Chatham House were tasked with producing the summary risk assessment, uh, uh, the summary risk assessment for, for heads of government that helps them particularly to understand that climate change is a risk requiring immediate decisive action. Um, and also to start to think about how climate risk is related to those other issues, which you saw from those, that fantastic work that Dan had done on the systemic risk. Now, when we looked at what the challenges were here, the policy move music um, was saying that, and again, this came from early engagement with stakeholders, um, that net zero pledges by 2050 are enough to take care of the problem. So 
we know that there's a climate risk, but we've already committed to um, net zero by 2050. We don't need to do any more. Um, the second thing that came up as a challenge that we knew that we needed to face was that heads of government are facing a constant stream of other pressures. Now, um, I, I, I can't say who this was, but, but we did hear from a senior advisor that, who said, how can I make, and I think actually this wasn't in this project, this was in another piece of work that we were doing, but how can I make the prime minister take climate change seriously when he has just come out of a meeting about North Korea and Russia? So it's this idea of like, how do you make climate change stand up to uh, these other things, but also relate to these other things? Um, and this idea that heads of government, you know, and their advisors were saying to us, we've had this climate risk information, but it's not increasing ambition. It's not actually making a change. No one is responding to that risk information in the way that we want them to. So what that looked like in terms of engagement activities, and, and something that I want to mention here is we knew that because we wanted to work with senior level policy advisors here, that we only had them for very short periods of time. So we had to devise ways of working with them that enabled us to get key information from them, to get responses from them, um, but also to, uh, to be able to let them go. So it didn't become burdensome upon their time. And what we worked out is we worked out that we probably couldn't get the same group of people again and again. But what we could do is we could work with um, small groups of one or two um, advisors, and then we could evolve the messaging based on the responses that they had, and then see how that resonated with another group who were very, very similar. And we kind of, a little bit, we did, didn't quite work like this because of availability, worked our way up to the senior, sort of the seniority levels as well, as well there. Um, what that helped us to do was to develop an understanding of their relevant risk currencies. It was from that piece of work um, that we really were able to, to understand the importance of national and international security and, and ensuring that the storytelling that we used around um, the, the way that, that, that risks were positioned and impacts were positioned was, um, was relating to that risk currency and speaking to those, those intuitive risks that they are managing. We also began this process by presenting the qualitative data without any storytelling. So we stripped the storytelling out and we, um, we got them to respond to the, 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 sorry, the quantitative data. Um, and that helped us to understand kind of how that sat with them, how that resonated with them, and particularly what it was that they were asking for. So we wanted to know what they felt was missing. And that helped us to construct the, the storytelling that would sit around the data, that would help them make sense of it, help them relate that to their needs, to the decisions that they had to make, to the challenges that they faced. And the outcome of that was that the summary report addressed, firstly, it, it, you know, it head on addressed the fact that existing policy pledges lack the delivery detail. So that policy move music issue, uh, we, we took that head on around saying, you know, you've got these 2050 pledges, but there's not actually a lot of detail around how you're going to realize them. And until that detail is in place, you know, this risk is still here and this needs to change because otherwise um, you are going to experience the risks that you see in this report. We then, the, the, the next thing that we did was, was started to think about how you weave together key statistics with storytelling elements to help convey, convey the impacts of, of change. And I think you, um, you saw this in the, the page that, that Dan brought up. And, um, and in particular, one key element of this was around using current and existing examples of disasters um, to, help them, uh, to help them gain a sense of what the data and the impacts could mean from, for them. And uh, on the page that Dan showed, uh, you had the 2007-2008 food crisis. Um, and so you have that sense of, okay, right, we've lived through that. Um, We've, 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 we've managed that. Sorry, am I just, was that a hint that I'm running over time? Apologies, yes. that was my internet dropped out, so it stopped the recording, but it's back right. on now. So please take okay. care.
Apologies, and I am right at the end. Um, but as you can see from the work that Dan presented, the report landed extraordinarily well. It received significant media, media attention, and it did resonate with those um, heads of government and leaders, uh, particularly Alok Sharma, um, who, as Dan said, is still using this report. So um, how to tackle these challenges? So I've got four tips. It started off as three tips and it became four. Um, so the first is to focus on listening when engaging with your policy end users. You'll notice when I talk about the work that we did, it was all about finding out their response, seeing what resonated with them, understanding what landed, understanding what they were still asking for, what they still needed. Um, trying to identify those potential ginger moments, the risk currencies and the dominant policy move music, they come up every single time. So having those there to lean on is super helpful because you can almost do a sense check. And then the, the third thing is to treat information generated through engagement with policy end users as experimental data. You know, a lot of us are researchers and have a research background. We can, if you start to think of that as data, as something that needs to be interrogated, you can then start to think, okay, well, what can I learn about that? And then you, that gives you an insight into the policymakers wants and needs. And then the last thing is about testing messages with end users um, and iterating them in response. So we talk about learning to take feedback seriously, but not literally. And what that means is that when you receive information from end users, when you get that feedback, and you have those responses. Sometimes they ask for specific things and taking them literally would be putting those things in the report. Sometimes that is the right thing to do, but sometimes they're reaching for the answer that they think is correct, but you can learn from that um, what it is that they actually need. And then you can begin to think about the best way to address that, which might not be quite what they're asking for, but it will give them what they need and it will get them to the place where they can use it. And so that would be taking that information seriously. So thank you so, so much. Um, that, that is the end of my presentation. I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Lucy. That was a really interesting presentation and some really useful tips there for how we can communicate um, and engage with um, policymakers. So thank you so much for that. Um, wonderful. Um, I'm now going to go straight through into the Q&A session. Um, if anyone has any questions, do please put them in the Q&A function. Um, to kick everything off, uh, a question for you, Daniel. Um, recent events have highlighted the weaknesses within international institutions and the challenges posed by nationalism promoted by certain individual heads of state or government. The outlook you presented looks a bit gloomy. Do you feel that your communications to the heads of state have been effective in securing political action that may limit climate change impacts? It's a very good question. I started typing an answer to this in the Q&A um, before and then decided that the question was maybe too difficult to answer. Um, I think the, tr the true answer is I don't think we see the impacts of any of these sorts of reports until many years later. Um, it's very, very difficult. Uh, within six months or a year to kind of, uh, I suppose, tangibly connect the description of risks and impacts to a change in policy. Um, and that's obviously increasingly difficult with the sort of world that we live in now, this sort of unipolar uh, world of uh, states acting in unilateral ways under increased uh, geopolitical tension. Um, so I think the true answer is, or the sort of uh, bare answer is, no, that's going to take some time, but the initial indications, given the sorts of feedback that both myself and Lucy highlighted, is that I think this climate change risk assessment, or the one that I presented, maybe had a diff, I'm not going to say better, but a different type of resonance than previous climate change risk assessments did have. And I think that's because of the work of Lucy and Chris and others, the workshops, the iterative approach of honing and refining those messages such that you are really producing a report for your audience, in this case, heads of state, heads of government. Without that, it just ends up becoming another climate change risk assessment that, you know, people are overwhelmed by numbers and statistics and everything else. So I would hope that as we go forward in time, we start to see that impact more clearly. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and this is a related, actually, another question from an attendee here is um, what precise, and this could be for either you or Lucy, Daniel, um, what precisely do you mean by having a resonance? Does it mean having an impact on decision making itself or in the process of decision making? 
I'll let Lucy go first. You want me to take it? You, you take it and then I'll, I'll jump in at the end. Cool. Okay. So for, for me specifically, when I talk about um, a message that resonates, um, what I mean is that it speaks to that idea of, of risk currency. It speaks to the concerns and the purpose of the individual and what they're working on. Um, what that doesn't necessarily directly translate into to action um, or into policy action, but by having a message that resonates with them, you are equipping them to be able to then turn that into policy action and to think about how that translates into policy levers. And I, I would just add that I think for me, by the time we were putting out the report, I was fairly com confident that messages that didn't have resonance were already removed from the report and messages that did have resonance were, you know, pushed up the order, you know, they, they were on page one rather than on page five um, because of that testing that Lucy has very eloquently uh, described we shouldn't have been in the position of putting out a report that we didn't know already had res resonance um, with policymakers. So yeah, it was tested during that process that Lucy was describing. Amazing, thank you both. Um, a question from Murray now. Um, I wonder if you could just talk a bit more about the climate services standard um, and how that's kind of going to be um, applied to different climate services, um, in particular, who will be assessing it and, and how that will work. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, this this is a project that's a two year project. It's due to finish in October. <clears throat> it's part of the UK climate research um, program of work and the Met Office is administering many of these projects. So this one is, is under their uh, auspices, but it's uh, as I put in the chat to uh, David Viner, it's a project that's been consulting with lots of different organisations in the UK and also uh, internationally recently. Um, the, the, the requirement here is to develop a, a standard for climate services, which will then be the output from that project, whether that standard then gets taken up as a, say, a British standard or, an inter, or could be used towards um, informing an ISO standard internationally or um, gets used by the WMO in Geneva for, for international standards for climate services is is a separate thing and will we'll follow on from this output of this project. Um, I think it partly depends on whether people want it and need it. Um, I think there is a lot of case for having a, a form of standard which is useful, but one of the things that's been interesting to work through on this project is that in order not to stifle innovation, this standard it may form a as well as having some requirement statements within it about you, you need to do this, it will also have a series of recommendations and advice about you may do this, we'd recommend you do this. So it's <clears throat> it's not a traditional standard in the sense that you, there's lots of things you have to follow, but it's got a lot of um, recommendations as well, which make it a form of guidance or code of practice. So whether it gets called a standard and code of practice, I'm not sure at the end, but th that's not a potential. So it's, um, yes, I, I don't know if that answers the question enough. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Thank you, Mary. Can I, can I just highlight one risk here, which is that the UK and the US and parts of Europe are, are very much further along the line of making country by country and region by region assessments of climate risks. That's not the case the world over. And as I highlighted in my presentation, these thresholds of impact are extremely different in different, different geographies. And so there is a risk around standards that we assume that one given standard is applicable in all geographies. And that's not true because a flood in Bangladesh, as I said in my presentation, is very different from a flood in Peru. And the impacts that stem from that are going to be different in different communities. So that I, I agree with Murray, standards, really important but they come with caveats and they come with risks if those caveats are not held in one's in the forefront of one's mind. Well, I could comment on that, but I think the standard will, will, will not be successful if it, if it is not applicable in that way. So I, I think there's no intention for this standard to be prohibitive of uh, different risks and different thresholds in different countries. Um, it is specifically a standard for the UK, but if its application gets taken up wider, 
there's certainly nothing in the standard at the moment <coughs> that would that would make it not work in say Bangladesh. I mean, it's it's talking about how you try to have quality in climate services. So climate services are just anything that uses climate information, takes it into some form of added value from which people can make decisions and, and be informed about. So it's it's a very generic term. So that the, the this standard is really just trying to help help improve quality in that, irrespective of the of the thresholds that are relevant or the the levels of risk. Great, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, Lucy, moving on to a question for you. Um, uh, we've got an attendee here saying it's uh, really interesting to hearing about the various approaches to presenting information to stakeholders. Um, as someone coming into environmental science from a storytelling background, they're curious to know whether you've engaged storytelling experts in sculpting messaging and potentially testing the efficacy of these contributions. So, yes, um, and it depends in different projects. We work with different, um, different people in, in kind of in different ways. So we didn't um, we didn't bring in anyone from a different disciplinary storytelling kind of expertise background. I should say within the CAU team, we do have an ex climate journalist and um, my colleague is a neuroscientist with a specialism in, in storytelling. So we do we do kind of have a more diverse group of backgrounds within the, the broadest CAU team, um, which we bring to bear on projects. But in addition to that, we have uh, worked with a group of journalists to um, to help to understand how they would construct messages and also to help to them to improve the way that they construct messages, um, particularly using action based storytelling. Um, so, so yes, it's extremely important um, to have that diversity of approach. Um, I don't think necessarily that it changes some of the analytic insights that we get into some of the challenges. Um, but what it is it does help is around how you can start to then think about how you respond to that and how you use those different stories that other people have to to develop um, yeah and to, to test and to, to see how they resonate great thank you um, and finally just to finish things off um, a question for each of you um, so I'll come to you each in turn um, which is thinking about looking ahead to COP27 how would you like to see climate risk included in discussions? Um, and in particular, is there a way that we can help to bridge that gap between discussing climate risk and putting in place adaptation measures? Anyone want to come up, come in on that first? Daniel? I'll just be really concise and it's really quite simple for me. I think, as Lucy highlighted, there is a, a narrative in policy circles that climate change can be adapted to certain elements of climate change can be adapted to or the impacts of climate change can be adapted to but not all and the sorts of trajectories that we're on surpass many of the adaptation possibility space as it were and so if we're talking about loss and damage and risk and adaptation in the future i think we need we need to be really careful about differentiating between those impacts that can be adapted to and those that can't and be really clear with decision makers and policy makers about that, because the latter, i.e. those that can't be adapted to, necessarily require greater mitigation efforts rather than adaptation. So we need to just really hold that in the forefront of our minds. That's really clear. Thank you. Um, Murray, did you want to come in? Well, uh, not to say very much. I agree with what Daniel just said, and um, I think if if adaptation can be presented as an important activity in, in the way that it was to some extent in Glasgow, but perhaps more could be done more so in the next event. I appreciate also that adaptation can't do everything and it shouldn't take away the enormous importance of the mitigation requirement. Thanks, Mary. And Lucy? Um, I think that that it's not an easy it's not it's not always an easy journey from from climate risk to either mitigation or adaptation and often we see uh policymakers struggling with how to reach for the levers that actually will enable change to happen that's a slightly different conversation than we, the one that we've had today but i would highlight that primarily today we have talked about climate risk 
as storytelling, so climate risk as helping people to understand the risk that is happening and to highlight that it's happening. There is a different type of climate risk information, which is for decision making, which I think speaks more to the type of information that you have been dealing with, Murray, um, and helping people to translate that into adaptive action. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of our speakers. Daniel, Murray, Lucy, really appreciated your contributions today. It's been a really, um, really important conversation, I think, that we've had and a lot of um, food for thought for our attendees. So thank you very much. Um, we've run out of time for today, I'm afraid. Um, so thank you for logging in, um, everyone. I hope you found that as beneficial and informative as I did. Um, don't forget to record your attendance at this webinar on the IES CPD tool. Um, and just a reminder that the next IES webinar is tomorrow uh, and is on regenerative farm management to reverse ecological decline. And you can register for this on our website. Thank you so much once again to our speakers and to all of you for watching. Goodbye. Thank you.